welcome to Worship at Medicine Street United Methodist Church. I am Harriet Brine, and we are thrilled that you are worshiping with us today. Whether you're worshiping with us online or you're here with us in person, we pray that today's service will be a blessing for you. I have to tell you that if I were God, I would be assigning extra credit for being in church on such a dreary day. I'm not God, but you've made this pastor's heart happy as I smile at you. And if you're worshiping online, we're grateful for you too. I'm not saying that, but you always wonder. Maybe I'm the only one who's tempted not to get out of bed. I don't know. Maybe that tells you more about me. Has following Jesus changed your life? How has following Jesus changed your life? If you're a follower, that's going to be what we're going to consider today. But right now, I invite you to, if you're in the sanctuary and you're sitting near the inner aisle, to find one of our row books. If you haven't already done so, sign in, pass it down the pew, and pass it back so you can see with whom you were in worship today. And if you're worshiping online, we really do ask that you would take just a few seconds and fill out that digital attendance card. Now, I invite you to take a deep breath knowing that you're in the presence of God and God's people, to smile at someone nearby if you haven't already done so, or just to do so again as we continue worshiping God together. I invite you to stand for the call to worship. Together, let's make a joyful noise to the Lord. We bring our sadness and our celebration, joining to worship the Lord with gladness, coming into God's presence with singing, sharing songs and stories, speaking and in song. Rejoice, for it is God who made us. We come from the Holy One. Today we give thanks for God, 
whose steadfast love endures forever. this table everyone is welcome at this table everyone is seen at this table everybody matters no one falls between this table you can say whatever at this table you can speak your mind at this table 
Paul's prayer for the Christians at the Church of Ephesus is also Paul's prayer for us. Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you will know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance for the holy people, and in his incomparable great power for us who believe. The power is that same as his mighty power strengthened as he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realm, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him 
who lifts everything in every way. As we prepare to hear the words of Jesus, will you stand as you're able? In this reading, these words of Jesus, we learned that the king is the one who takes up residence with the least, the last, and the lost. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right hand and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invited you in, or needed clothing and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will answer, truly I tell you, Whatever you did to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you did not give me to drink. I was a stranger. And you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, or needed clothes or sick or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whoever you did to one of the least of these, you did to me. Then they will go away to the eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, your word has been read and it is about to be proclaimed. We ask now that you would open our hearts and minds by the power and inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we might hear a word from you today. Amen. I don't know how many of you have ever called the Butterball Turkey Hotline. It's been in existence since 1981, and they've expanded with the times. You can now text the number. You can chat online as of this year. You can even say, Alexa, call Butterball. <laughs> Evidently, we need help knowing how to cook turkeys. And the number one question that is asked is, how do you properly thaw a turkey? So. Next year rolls around and you're having difficulties, just tuck that away. 1-800-BUTTERBALL, they'll answer your questions. My favorite story from this hotline occurred some years ago, and a woman called in and asked about a turkey that had been in a freezer for 23 years. Yes, 23 years. She wanted to know if it would be safe to eat. And the poultry expert on the other end asked some questions. Well, had it been below zero the whole time, the freezing? And finally said, well, it's edible, but I can't imagine that after all this time, it has much taste left, to which the woman promptly replied, that's what I thought. We're going to give it to the church. <laughs> now, friends, I was sorely tempted at this point to say, don't be like that woman and sit down. And some of you would applaud and say, Harriet, that was your best sermon ever. And others of you would be like, uh, why do we pay her a salary? All she did was tell one story. So I'm going to continue, hopefully not too terribly long. The question that I raised earlier that I think this scripture raises, as well as last week's passage, was how has following Jesus changed us? How has it changed our priorities? I believe that we are called to live in light of Jesus' injunction to take care of the least of these, because when we do so, we are caring for Christ himself. I ran across this quote by Stanley Harawas, who's an ethicist, and if I'd found it earlier, I would have it in the bulletin, but I found it this weekend, so. But Harawas writes, the difference between followers of Jesus and those who do not know Jesus is that those who have seen Jesus no longer have any excuse to avoid the least of these. Or as Caroline Lewis writes, if we have to ask Jesus, when was it, then we haven't been paying attention. If we have to ask Jesus, when was it, then we don't really believe that our actions make a difference in making Christ visible on the earth. When was it is never a question are those of those who are certain of God's activity in this world and who understand that God's inviting us to participate with those whom God desires to bless. Quite simply, following Jesus will always change our priorities. We will live with purpose, and as we live with purpose, we will also learn how to live with margin so that we are able to respond to the needs of those whom we encounter. One of my favorite stories, and I hope that after I'm long gone, some of you will remember this story because I tell it every year, every other year, comes from the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. It is a story of challenge, and it is a story of inspiration. While Wesley, who lived from 1703 to 1791, so quite some time ago, but while Wesley was a student studying at Oxford, he had gone out one day to purchase pictures to hang on the walls of his apartment. And later that evening, a young woman came to his door and knocked. 
And when he opened the door, he saw that she was shivering because she only had a thin linen dress to wear. He reached into his pocket to pull out some coins to give her so that she could get a coat, and he realized that he didn't have money to give her because of the pictures that now adorned his wall. It was a turning point in Wesley's life. He wrote in his journal later that night, Will my master say, well done, good and faithful steward? Thou hast adorned thy walls with the money that might have protected this poor creature from the cold. O oh, justice, O oh, mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? And so after that, he figured out how much he needed to live on. And in that day and age, it was 28 pounds per year. 28 pounds. That's what he needed. And so the, his records indicate that his income the first year was $30, and he had to spend 28 do, 20 pounds, pounds, British pounds. If I say dollars, don't let me confuse you. Spent only 28 pounds and gave the rest of it away. In the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds. Again, he lived on 28 pounds, giving 62 pounds away. The fourth year, he made 120 pounds and gave 92 pounds to the poor. Wesley preached that Christians should not merely tithe, but give away all extra money once family and bills were paid. He believed that with increasing income, the Christian standard of giving should increase, not our standard of living. And he practiced what he preached always. Even when his income rose into the thousands of pounds, he lived on those 28 pounds and gave the rest away. Now, he didn't have children. He didn't have grandchildren. He didn't have other expenses. I will grant you that. But he made that his practice his entire life. One year, his income was slightly over 1,400 pounds, and he gave away all but 30 pounds. When he died in 1791, the only money mentioned in his will was the miscellaneous coins to be found in his pockets and his dresser doors. Most of the funds he had earned in his lifetime, he had given away. John Wesley's royalties at one time gave him what would today be an annual income of $160,000. And he lived on $20,000 and gave the rest away. Now, grant you, most of us are not going to be that radical, although you may have noticed Chris Davis on News Channel 5 had a story this today about a man living in New Hampshire who was a caretaker of a mobile home park and on his death, they found out that he had left $4 million to the little New Hampshire town in which he lived. So there are stories like that and today, not just in the 1700s. But most of us find that more challenging. Some of you have heard me tell the story about how I began to tithe. I've always given to the church. I mean, that was the example that was set for me growing up. But I never quite met that 10% benchmark until I was a pastor and I had two members of the church, one whom worked for the IRS and the other who was a CPA, offer to help me with my taxes. And as soon as they offered to help me with my taxes, I was like, I've got a tithe. They've got to see that I give 10%. I can't talk about this if I'm not doing it. So that's one way um, to begin to practice what one preaches. And I rocked along like that for several years. This always makes me uncomfortable, but I do believe it's important for you to know I practice what I preach. I rocked along like that for several years, feeling pretty complacent. I was meeting the standard. And then the Reverend Dr. Judy Cummings in Nashville, who at the time was an associate pastor at a missionary Baptist church. You know, and Baptists just always, they grow up tithing. I don't know, somehow we Methodists lose that. But anyway, she said, you know, in the church I serve, Harriet, we have double tithers. We don't just give 10%, we give 20%. I was like, what in the world? That's taking it to a whole nother level. 
But since then, and again, I know my circumstances are different. Hear me say I don't have children, I don't have grandchildren. But I have made that my goal, that the church gets the first 10% of what I earn, and then the next 10% goes to causes that I care about locally and globally. This is probably the only area in my life where I would tell you I set a standard that others could follow. Um, and we're gonna leave it there. We're not gonna go to any other areas. C.S. Lewis once wrote, and I think this is a helpful guiding principle, that how can we know whether or not we are giving enough if we are responding to God's call upon our lives? And his answer was, if we don't from time to time have to give up something that we want to have or to do, the answer is we're probably not doing enough that God's really not first in our hearts. Now, I don't want this to sound like this is a heavy burden. One of you said to me just this past week how much joy she finds in giving and in blessing others. And I've known so many people who have shared that as well. One of my first appointments, I was told that there was a man in the congregation who got angry if a stewardship letter ever reached him and his wife begged me, when it's time to mail out stewardship letters, please take ours out. I will support, but I don't want to listen to him complain and say, the church just wants my money. That's all the church is interested in. Friends, I never had a conversation with him. I was young, scared. But if I were to have a conversation with him today, what I would say is, it's not that the church just wants your money. This is not about coercion. It's about partnering with God and releasing God's blessings. It's about having an opportunity to say that following Jesus makes a difference in my life. I quoted Sam Wells last week, who's a vicar in England, and I'm going to quote him again. Wells writes, Offering money in a collection plate or through a bank account or QR code isn't fundamentally about paying the church's bills. It's about gratitude. God's creative gifts, the love of God displayed in the life of Christ, the empowerment of the community through the work of the Holy Spirit, these are not services rendered we pay for, like a subscription to a newspaper or a membership at a gym. These are graces that shower us and overwhelm us and surround us and embrace us for which no payment could ever suffice, that no sacrifice could ever match, no service ever offset. Church is the physical form by which we communicate our gratitude to God. We, of course, can close our eyes every day and thank God and count our blessings. But being thankful means more than just saying thank you. It means shaping our whole lives to be one of gratitude and generosity, ensuring not just we, but all God's children hear, embrace, and enjoy the wonder of God's love, practicing over and over again our response to the way God is present to us and cherishing the stories and example Jesus gave us so we may be built up in Christ's body so that we may be like Jesus and we may continue Jesus' ministry. Beyond our lives and the existence of the universe themselves, the chief gifts of God are traditionally described as forgiveness and as eternal life. And I so wish I had written these next words, but Sam Wells did. Forgiveness turns our past from a prison of pain into a storehouse of wisdom. Eternal life turns our future from a panic of oblivion into a hope of glory. No bargain could entitle us to these things. No payment could even come remotely near them. They are literally priceless. How do we respond to them? Not by nodding from time to time in God's direction and saying, thanks. We say thank you by ordering our lives, including our money, in such a way that our gratitude to God is the first thing we express in the morning and the last thing at night, and that our gratitude to God is the context of every decision and the guiding principle of every life choice, and that offering back to God a significant gesture of thanks and praise 
is the first item on our monthly household budget, not the one we get around to if there's anything left. We don't give to the church to pay bills. We give because church is the primary means by which we express our gratitude to all the things beyond price that God has given us. So, some questions come to mind for us in light of today's scripture lessons. Why is it so hard to put God first? Why is it we can find room for one more holiday party, one more piece of turkey, one more dessert, one more car in the mall parking lot, one more present hidden in the hall closet, one more charge on the credit card? Why is it we can find room for those things and we struggle when it comes to putting God first? Now here's something that's important for us to remember. In the New Testament, there's a difference between judgment and condemnation. Judgment is a loving act by someone who wants to help us avoid condemnation. It always offers a better possibility and another chance. Jesus is always calling us to make our lives count. The story of the separation of the sheep and goats is not intended to make us feel guilty. It is an invitation to be like Jesus. Every good act is important. Not that we're accepted by God because of our goodness. Most certainly not. We are accepted by God because of God's grace. But good acts are the outgrowth of a life connected to God, of those who say we want to follow Jesus. So the invitation today is to consider how are we making our lives matter. Amen. When we pray together, we always have on our minds those among us who are struggling with health issues or with grief or loneliness. We pray for one another for encouragement and all kinds of ways to make life better. This morning, uh, Harriet learned that a friend of hers, a friend of some of you in this community, Jessica Clark, a young mother with two young children, uh, passed away from complications of brain surgery. And we can only imagine the grief, the shock that family is experiencing today. With all of these concerns that we bring to this time, will you pray with me? <clears throat> oh God, we have uh, completed another year of the Christian journey. We began by anticipating Christ's coming, and we today acknowledge that he reigns in love and grace over all. We've come full circle. We end, O oh God, by being reminded that He is King, He is the Lord of all, because He emptied Himself in love, taking the form of a servant. And this quality, O oh God, that we share with one another is the life that Christ gave us when we are faithful to one another, pray for one another, care for one another, we are witnessing to the power of the body of Christ. So we come to you asking your grace again upon all in our reach under the sound of our voice who may need encouragement and consolation, who may need uh, extra strength for what they're battling who may need to have patience and encouragement to hold on in the face of ongoing illness. We accept, O oh God, the responsibility that Jesus placed before us when, as he was king, he took residence with the least, the last, and the lost. There we see him. There we experience him. And thank you for the ways, the many ways, that we as a people of Jesus try to care for others. But there's always more to do, O oh Lord. Enable us, broaden our minds and our perspectives 
that we may continue to be faithful to Jesus as the body of Christ. And now for these concerns we've mentioned, we pray your wisdom, your power upon them, ease the suffering, O oh God, the darkness of grief. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I always thank God for you and for your generosity. And I thank every one of you who's already turned in your commitment card for our estimates of giving for next year. If you haven't already done so, after the sermon I just preached, it will not surprise you to know I'm going to invite you to do so. We have boxes available. You may put them in the offering plate. You may give online. But we really do want to pool our resources together and see what God does in and through us in 2024. Also, I want you to note that in the bulletin, there is a word that today is United Methodist Student Sunday. And if you have the means and want to assist, the United Methodist Church awards over five and a half million dollars every year in scholarships.
Let's go back in time just a few seconds. Go ahead and give God a thank offering for that wonderful offertory. Also, you may have noticed the Reverend Dr. Tim Sharp is not among us today. He will be flying back from Italy. He was president of the jury that was judging an international choral conductors competition. So he'll be back with us. Just thought that was amazing and thought that I would share that. In your bulletin, you have two different inserts. One's about how you order poinsettias in honor or memory of someone. The other is about Christmas for kids. Friends, it's coming December 9th. It will be here. There's information about gifts to purchase. We'll be giving you more information about how you may volunteer. So please be on the lookout for that. And please also don't forget that the festival of Christmas is the day after on the 10th. And it will be an incredibly meaningful experience. Now, if you're a guest of ours and you're in the sanctuary and you've not stopped at the Guest Connection table, we invite you to do so. We would like to give you a small gift. And if you're worshiping online, we ask that you would text WELCOME to 740-1882 so that we might follow up with you. And the next, following this service, this will not be live streamed, but if you're able to stay, there will be a prayer for those soldiers who died in the training exercise on Veterans Day, and that will be on our front lawn. Thanks to Wally Crow for making the memorial possible for us. But now, friends, you may not need to take a deep breath, but I do. So take a deep breath as we sing God's praises together.
Friends, remember, it's never God's desire for us to wallow in guilt. It is God's desire for us to experience the joy of gratitude and generosity. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be yours on this day and forevermore. Amen.